Good afternoon, everyone. I'm seeing more and more people joining. We will wait uh, one to two more minutes before we get majority of people joining in. And welcome to all eye care practitioners from Asia Pacific. A very warm welcome. I hope everybody is uh, staying safe and healthy. And we will start our webinar in one minute. For those who have signed in, you have already been muted. So today it's only the uh, panelists and the presenter who will be able to have their microphone unmute. Very good, we have more and more people joining in. We'll wait uh, one more minute as uh, I'm seeing more and more people joining in. And today we have, um, we have 1,000 uh, participants uh, joining uh, in a webinar. So thank you for joining. Um, and uh, after the webinar, we will be sending a recording to those who are not able to attend the webinar today. Hello to our Indian ECP. You're very active in the chat box. Thank you. Good afternoon, all. All right, let me start uh, the, you know, we have uh, only one hour, so let me try to start now uh, and do a very quick introduction and welcoming. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Johnson & Johnson Institute webinar series. My name is Karen Cheng from Johnson & Johnson Professional Education Team in Asia Pacific. Today, we're very privileged to have uh, Professor Philip Morgan with us. Professor Morgan is the head of optometry, deputy head of the Division of Pharmacy and Optometry and the director of Eurolens Research at the University of Manchester. Today, Professor Morgan will be sharing with us the COVID-19 pandemic and its implications for the management of contact lens wearer. Now, prior to passing over to Professor Morgan, there are a few housekeeping that need to be reminded. So please, be ma please be reminded that we are in the webinar mode. Therefore, all participants will be put on mute. Only the presenter and the facilitator will be unmuted. However, if you have any question during the webinar, please raise it through the Q&A function by clicking the Q&A icon on your screen. After the webinar, we will also hold a 15 minutes live Q&A session with Professor Morgan. The chat function will now be disabled so that we can streamline all questions to the Q&A function. Now, over to you, Phil, and looking forward to learn from you the latest research in the field related to COVID-19 and contact lenses. Here you go, Phil. Right. 
Yeah, thank you, Karen. What a great pleasure it is for me to talk uh, with uh, colleagues all across the Asia-Pacific region. So good afternoon to you. Good morning from the United Kingdom and from Manchester. Actually, the photograph that's on my first screen, of course, I've not seen that building, which is our main building at the university for about eight weeks. We've been under lockdown now for eight weeks, and I know that many of you either have been or perhaps still are in, under some sort of lockdown conditions. And what a remarkable time that we're living in. Who, who would have thought just three or four months ago that uh, you'd be listening to a presentation or I would be delivering a presentation on this, on this topic? And we've learned so much about this pandemic. We're, we're beginning, I think, to understand what it means for our roles as eye care practitioners, what it means for our contact lens patients. And that's what I'm going to try and cover today. There's so much new information and it's, a, it's a, a delight to be able to share it with you. As Karen mentions, I run a research group at the University of Manchester just to disclose that we're in receipt of funding and have received great support over the years from many contact lens companies who um, fund so much of the research and, 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 and help bring knowledge to us all as ECP. So I, I want to acknowledge them and I'm grateful for that support over many years now. Now, much of the information I'm going to be sharing today, we summarized in a recent paper. This paper uh, with uh, such fantastic colleagues, uh, Lyndon Jones, Karen Walsh, Mark Wilcox, and Jason Nichols, led by our colleagues mainly at the Center for uh, Ocular Research and Education at the University of Waterloo in Canada, Lyndon Jones uh, leading this uh, recent initiative. But I'm going to be covering uh, a lot of what I'll cover today is, is in this paper. Uh, which was published a month ago. It presented a review of everything we knew at that time about this pandemic, about this virus and contact lens, and it is available for free download. Uh, if you go to that website, covid19cl.com, C-O-V-I-D-19-C-L.com, you, you actually will get straight to this, the, the PDF, it's a free download, and you'll be able to see all of the, um, the thoughts at that time at least, um, on this pandemic. So you, that's a, a helpful accessory to this talk. So what do we know? Well, I think we know that our world has changed uh, with, with this, this virus, but it's been such a, such a sudden change. If we just look at um, uh, what was happening in the early stages of the, of the year, here we see the death toll uh, in the early parts of the year through January and now into February. Uh, and we'll just stop here at the end of February, where at that point, sadly, close to 3,000 people had died in China, but really there was very little impact elsewhere in the world. But when we now move through March, we see the death toll, unfortunately, quickly accelerating through many countries, and it became uh, something of a European problem pr primarily in March. And now as we go uh, through April, we see the death toll hugely rising, uh, as you know, and then the United States becoming the, uh, the major problem spot until, uh, until yesterday. Here's the situation of yesterday, and certainly this is something which has affected us in the United Kingdom massively, with over 30,000 people now died, unfortunately, from this virus. Um, uh, many of the uh, countries across Asia Pacific, I put in this chart as well, it's uh, had much less of an impact, at least in terms of deaths, although um, I know in terms of way of life, lockdown, it's been very similar uh, as it is in the rest of the world. So, of course, we're describing this new virus, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2, the SARS uh, Coronavirus 2, which leads to this disease, uh, first reported in 2019, right at the end of 2019. So that gets the abbreviation of COVID-19. And as of yesterday, over 4 million cases worldwide and approaching 300,000 deaths with this global uh, pandemic. So let's talk a little bit about what we know about coronaviruses. There have been 40 coronaviruses identified and named in history, sort of more, more than maybe uh, we think. Most of these uh, affect animals, not humans, but there have been seven strains which have known to uh, affect humans. Now the first four of these which were identified have been around planet around the globe for many decades. These uh, can infect humans, but they only give minor symptoms, They're sort of sniffles, the symptoms of the common cold. But of course, more recently, we've had new coronaviruses identified, and these are a much 
greater concern. So close to 20 years ago, we had the first SARS uh, epidemic, um, uh, which affected a small number of countries and caused a, a relatively small number of deaths in, in, compared with what's happening currently. About 10 years ago, we had the Middle East respiratory syndrome coronavirus, the MERS virus. And of course, now we have uh, the SARS coronavirus 2 uh, situation. It's actually relevant to our role as ECPs and contact lens practitioners to understand a little of the structural biology of this virus. This particular virus contains its, uh, has its RNA, which is surrounded by a shell, the nuclear capsid, and that shell is then surrounded by a lipid bilayer envelope. And the fact that this envelope is made up of lipids, in fact, is important for some of the things I'll talk about later on. So remember that lipids are important here. Um, now, there are a number of proteins which actually are anchored uh, in the envelope and then sort of stick out. And uh, this is what's shown on the bottom right image here. These, uh, these proteins stick out and the, the sort of end points of these uh, proteins form something that looks like a crown or a corona, giving the virus its name. Now, clinically, what's important to appreciate is how it interacts with cells on the body. And in particular, this particular, these proteins have an affinity for a, a, a human enzyme, angiotensin converting enzyme to the ACE2 enzyme. And it is this ACE2 enzyme, which is on the surface of cells in many human tissues. And this is how ultimately it, um, it, it invades, infects, and potentially kills us. It's known that the ACE, these ACE2 enzyme or these ACE2 receptors are present in great numbers in lung tissue. And so the infection generally, when it's severe, means that uh, patients uh, breathe in the virus. The virus binds to this enzyme or protein on the surface of lung cells. Uh, and this allows the virus to actually invade and replicate within the lung cells. And unfortunately, death is caused by a, 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 an extreme local immune response. This is called a cytokine storm, a massive immune response in the lung that um, overwhelms the systems and ultimately uh, kills, the, kills the person. It's, it is, has been said that people who are taking ACE2 inhibitors, which is a common therapy for hypertension, actually may be more susceptible to this disease because if you take this particular therapy, ACE2 inhibitors, then actually you get a, a, expre a greater expression of the ACE2 enzyme on tissues, and maybe you're more susceptible uh, to, this, um, to this infection. So we know that probably the primary, the primary transmission is the airborne through keep people coughing and sneezing and spluttering in the presence of others who then breathe in this virus and it gets to the lung. Uh, and because of the presence of ACE2 receptors, then um, um, it, it, it can cause infection. What's very important for us, I think, to understand is what we know about the expression of this enzyme, the ACE2 enzyme, at the ocular surface. There is a big debate raging at the moment about whether this enzyme is or is not present in numbers in cornea and conjunctival cells. It seems that overall, it's probably limited. That would be my overall impression of the literature uh, at this time. Uh, the same group of colleagues, this time led by Mark Wilcox, uh, we've just published another paper looking particularly at this question. What do we know about the interaction between this virus and the ocular surface? Uh, this has been accepted for publication in the Australian journal Clinical and Experimental Optometry. So please watch out for that. And, and uh, I think you'll find that uh, very interesting and helpful in understanding the current situation. And I think in general, what we need to be doing at the minute is remember our role as clinical scientists. If we ever need to use our uh, experience to look at information, work through what the current messages are, try and understand what it means for our roles as ECPs, now is the time. Now is the time we need to be wearing our hats as clinical scientists. There is so much information coming out. I received a new paper this morning that I'm gonna briefly mention in today's talk. This paper actually contradicts a paper I was reading on Sunday evening. The, the in, amount of information coming through at the moment is enormous. And I would urge everybody you know, to try and keep on track 
of the information because it will impact what we do uh, as clinicians and what we do to our patients. So an important consideration then is what is the likelihood of ocular infection uh, by this virus? One way of looking at this is to look at people who have the disease, the uh, COVID-19 disease, and looking at what's happening to their eyes. And it's unusual for the virus to be identified in the tear film. It is unusual for people who have COVID-19 infection, 19 infection to have a conjunctivitis. The literature at the moment suggests that transmission through the tear film is low. But we need to understand more. There is new information coming out all the time. A paper which is due to appear next week in the British Medical Journal, it's available online at the moment. Again, this is the incredible amount of information that's coming out every day. Um, this is a patient which looked at 17,000, a paper which looked at 17,000 patients with this disease presenting across the United Kingdom. And when they looked at the presentation symptoms on arrival at hospital, we see that conjunctivitis is very unusual. Um, much less than 1% of patients in this study who have COVID-19 have conjunctivitis. And this, I think, tells us a little bit about the propensity for infection at the ocular surface and for the virus to attach at the ocular surface. It, 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 overall, I believe it, that is a relatively low risk at this time, but information is coming out. Uh, all the time. Um, more particularly about contact lenses and solutions, what do we know? Well, there, there were early reports of differences of attachment of this virus to different sorts of contact lens uh, materials. Now, we looked at this carefully in our review, and we don't see any clear evidence for this. I don't think we, sh we are in a situation where different materials attract this virus in different different ways. That's certainly no strong evidence for that. What do we know about solutions? Well, at this time, as far as I'm aware, there's been no direct work looking at the impact or the effectiveness of uh, contact lens solutions against the virus. So we have to look at the literature and make some sensible conclusions. Uh, historically, um, the evidence is somewhat equivocal for the performance of contact lens solutions against viruses. To be made available on the market, contact lens solutions do not need to show performance against viruses because in general, it's not considered to be a major issue during contact lens wear, a viral infection. What we do know though, and, and this takes us back to that issue about the lipid bilayer that surrounds the, um, the, uh, this virus, is that um, rub and rinsing does help. So patients who rub and rinse their lenses, uh, probably that helps remove any, any virus that may be on, on the lens. And the fact that we've got this lipid bilayer probably makes the virus quite vulnerable to detergents and surfactants. This is why we're encouraged to wash our hands all the time because uh, simple household detergents that are in uh, washing up liquid and, and hand soaps will kill the virus. And I think we would expect the same from the surfactants that are in multi-purpose solutions. So coincidentally, perhaps, um, the sorts of products we have, the ingredients that we have in contact lens solutions are probably very helpful to killing this virus. It's fairly early in this. I've mentioned that new information is coming out all the time. We don't have much direct evidence at the moment. But when we look at what we know with previous um, uh, viral problems like uh, keratoconjunctivitis or herpes simplex or HIV, um, then we can be, I think, reasonably confident that contact lens wear should not be an obvious problem in the current situation. And those viruses are a bit different than the current coronavirus. Um, but if we look overall, we don't expect this to be a major issue for our contact lens wearers. What about spectacles? We heard reports that maybe spectacles m could offer some protection against this virus. I, I would be concerned that people would wear spectacles as a specific protective mechanism. They're really quite small. They're not really proper protective devices, of course. And if people wear spectacles thinking it's a major protection and, and perhaps they're then less concerned about washing their hands and this sort of thing, that would give me some degree of concern. So I don't think our patients should be wearing spectacles thinking they're a major 
protective device. We're also, of course, trying to stop touching our face uh, and our mouth and nose in particular. Well, if, if spectacles are going on all day long, well, maybe that's one way the virus could be transmitted to the face. So we should encourage our patients to wash their spectacles uh, and keep them clean again with probably just with washing up liquid, a simple wash um, before, they, before they wear them. Where can we get information from? Well, one approach is from the major health institutions worldwide. Um, and I guess a lot of people were waiting for the guidance from the United States Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC. Of course, they're giving guidance specifically out to Americans, but um, uh, their advice, I think, is highly regarded worldwide. So it's interesting to know what um, they say. Well, uh, uh, just about a month ago, they came up with their advice suggesting that there's no evidence that contact lens wearers are more at risk of this disease than people wearing uh, spectacles. And um, as long as uh, contact lenses are worn safely and carefully, it's okay to continue to wear contact lenses at this time. Their advice around solutions was perhaps less clear cut, saying that peroxide should be effective. We're not so sure about multi-purpose solutions, but this is because there's no direct evidence at the moment. Nobody, at least publicly, has tested the, how well peroxides and multi-purpose solutions to kill this virus. All the labs that are working on these questions are busy doing other things uh, at the moment. Uh, but I think we should be reasonably confident about the performance of our existing contact lens care solutions at this time. The professional bodies, of course, uh, are active. Um, I know we have multiple countries that are listening to this today. You perhaps will all be getting information from your own professional associations. In the UK, we have some advice from our group, the College of, uh, um, the College of Optometrists, you know, suggesting that at the moment, if we are to see patients, then we should be wearing face masks. We should try and not do very much from uh, a very close distance, although that, is, of course, is hard as our role as optometrists and ECPs. But professional associations increasingly now coming out with this advice. Although my impression right now is that we don't see great consistency around the world. We will start to see this in coming weeks, I think, about exactly what we should do. What protection, if any, should we be wearing? But it's something we all collectively need to think about. Um, academic advice, I will mention this website, covidifacts.org, hosted by our colleagues at, uh, at CORE at the University of Waterloo, where there is further information uh, about uh, what we should be doing and what our patients should be doing. Okay, we've got two questions we're gonna to ask today. Here's the first question. I'm gonna ask Ahmad Priest to bring up the first question. This relates to um, uh, how your practice is right now. Those of you working in practice, um, what is the situation for your practice uh, right now? Uh, I'm, I'm not seeing that on the screen, but it might it might be showing. Here we go. I can see this now. So there are one, two, three, four, five options here. Can you just indicate which best represents your situation? Uh, are you are you fully closed? Are you partly open, or are you fully open at this time? Uh, let's just give everybody uh, ten or fifteen seconds to answer this question, please. Amod gives me an opportunity for a little drink here. Okay, wow, well, we're seeing a huge number of responses. Thanks, everybody, for uh, giving your response here. It's coming in. Um, Ahmad, maybe we could, uh, maybe we could share, the, uh, share the results there, if we can do that with the, with the audience. Sure. Very good, thank you. So here are our results. Um, a bit varied, uh, but the majority are fully closed, but we see some activity across all of these options with uh, also many places mainly open. Only 7% actually fully open at this time. So what, what an astonishing time this is for our roles as, as EP, ECPs. Thanks for, uh, thanks for answering that question. 
Okay, so what, are, what, are the, what is the current situation clinically? What are the issues we have? Well, I know that, and this will vary depending on where you are. These are the, the sort of major, this is the number of deaths in, in, in recent times in some of the major outbreak cities. But many of us are in, regardless of whether we have a large number of deaths in our countries, we are operating mainly in a different way. But we certainly are potentially seeing healthcare systems stretched. We're also seeing a lot of our patients in some sort of lockdown conditions as well. They should not be leaving home at this time. So we want to make sure that everything that we do is going to ensure safe contact lens wear, particularly at the moment for our patients. We don't want them to have to leave their homes to get clinical advice if we can. Uh, we don't, and, and a lot of uh, healthcare systems are stretched, eye care practices are often closed. So we need to ensure, particularly at this time, safe uh, contact lens wear. A little example about why this is, is relevant here is uh, we see certainly in the UK, for example, ophthalmologists being moved from eye care into different parts of uh, healthcare settings. And you might be seeing something similar in your countries. There are less and less eye care services uh, locally available. So we've got to think a little bit differently. And, and I think we're going to see tremendous changes to uh, optometry as a profession in many countries uh, in very short time. Change, I was just talking yesterday with a colleague, changes that might have taken 20 years to come about. I think we're going to see come about in the next six months because this pandemic has forced us to change uh, the way we do things. Uh, many of you are only seeing urgent patients, so you will have thought through how are you going to do that? How are you going to um, triage your patients over the telephone? Do we need to do more work in telemedicine or what we might call teleoptometry or tele contact lens uh, practice? We have to suddenly think in very different ways. This is the situation in urgent optometry in the United Kingdom in 2020. I, I've never seen, I, I never thought I would see photographs like this. Colleagues, optometrists working, seeing urgent patients either in hospitals or in uh, emergency clinics that they have. And I, I just think these are such astonishing pictures. I don't think we're gonna be need to see um, a, um, protection like this worn uh, routinely, but certainly at the current time, this is what we're seeing for optometry in many parts of the world. And I mentioned this is gonna force changes on eye care, on optometry or on, on, on your, your, however things are organized in your country. We've seen overnight that optometry has changed in the UK. We've seen a, a, a new national system, the COVID-19 urgent eye care service system, which is going to mean that a lot of patients who otherwise would be seeking eye care in a hospital setting here in the UK are going to be uh, now seen by uh, optometry practices and a lot via triage over the phone or telephone conference. And maybe changes will come about in your countries as well. I think this is going to bring about a lot of change for us. We know that certainly, again, thinking about those of you who are optometrists, we know that optometrists have a lot of um, uh, important skills here. A recent paper published out of Manchester in, the, uh, in the, the Journal of the Royal College of Ophthalmology showing that actually therapeutically qualified optometrists, at least in our setting, are just as capable as ophthalmologists at dealing with these urgent sorts of cases. Here's an interesting example, you know, one example of how we have to think differently at this time. A colleague of mine, Kayo Patel, also here in the UK, uh, had set up an emergency triaging system via, uh, via email. He received an email from one of his patients about, about a month ago. She was complaining of a, a sore red eye. He phoned this patient was confident that she was not symptomatic of COVID-19 disease, agreed to see her within an hour. He was at his practice uh, and saw uh, the images that you see at the top here, this uh, corneal ulcer with uh, cells in the anterior chamber, a red eye, which he treated with cyclopentylate, with, uh, with antibiotics. Uh, again, followed up with a, a phone call the next day, actually saw her a few days later, that's the lower images, things had, things had settled down. This is just an example of how we have to think differently. How much of our work can we do actually over the telephone with our patients? Um, can we do some routine contact lens aftercares to some extent uh, over the telephone, over video conference, 
I, I don't know. We have to think all of this through, but it is going to bring about a lot of changes. And there's a big list here of what might happen next. Do we need to be talking to our patients before they can even make an appointment to, so we can satisfy ourselves that they're not symptomatic of this disease, particularly in countries where it is, uh, uh, where, it, where, it is uh, where the epidemic is, is happening in particular? This would be Europe, but you know, we, keep, we keep hearing about fresh uh, outbreaks in, in Korea we've been reading about. Singapore has been, uh, had some problems recently. I know things are fairly quiet in, uh, in Australia at this time. China seems to be settled down, but we read in some outbreaks once again in Wuhan and in other places. So we maybe have to think about talking with our, our patients on the phone and doing much more teleoptometry, tele contact lens uh, practice. What about in the practice environment itself? Do we need to limit numbers, have social distancing for the next few months? Certainly, I think we need to have extra hygiene, extra hand washing. Um, uh, hopefully, uh, many of you will have access to sinks in your consulting rooms. If that's not as easy, then uh, hand sanitization is going to be important, I think, for yourselves and for patients in some way. And then we have to start to think about masks and gloves and face shields. How much of this is going to be important? And I think the information is still settling down. I don't think there is a consistent message yet uh, around the world. But I, one thing is sure that we will see an elevation of the protection that we will need to uh, employ. I think things like uh, shields on slit lamps are going to be, uh, become commonplace. And what about the way that actually we provide contact lenses? Is this going to change? Maybe we need to move to uh, systems where patients can receive their lenses directly from the manufacturers and they don't have to come in to receive lenses. I think it's going to cause a big shift in what we do. If you'd like to learn a little bit more about what's happening in Europe, uh, then I, I'd refer you to this recent um, discussion that we had across Facebook. If you uh, search on Facebook for European Optometry Life After Lockdown, here's a short video clip. It included colleagues from around Europe, including Eric Robertstadt here. He was talking about how he has reorganized his clinic, how he has built his own slit lamp shields, and there's a lot of good information for what is happening right now in Europe within contact lens practice. So have a look on Facebook for that if you're interested. European optometry, life in lockdown. But we have to think very differently. Uh, I'm grateful to my colleague here, Ian Cameron, who let me share this video that he put out on his Facebook page for his practice about how patients can be advised to take photographs of their own eyes. If, if we want, if we're working in a different way, Maybe we need patients to send in their photographs to, for us to help them and advise them. And he, uh, on his Facebook page, he describes how you can use a sort of a second mirror and you can get good quality photos of your eyes using the front camera, not the selfie camera, the, the front camera on your phone. So if you look on Facebook for Cameron Optometry, you'll be able to find this video. Let's go to our second question now, please, Ahmad. This relates to what, if you are in practice, if you're back working again now, what protection are you currently using? Or if you are not yet open, but you anticipate opening in the next few weeks, which of these do you think will, um, will uh, best represents what you will do? Now, perhaps you can, you can click all that apply uh, or, or just click the main one uh, that you will, you envisage, using in the next few uh next few uh next few weeks i think this is absolutely fascinating how this is going to change how we are going to work as as ecps and it looks like a lot of people are indicating they're going to um certainly use masks both on themselves and on their patients uh, slit lamp screens, maybe 71% uh, of people reporting that. Uh, actually, I'm on. Maybe we can uh, just share share the the results, please. If, if I don't think everybody can see those at the moment. Thanks again for everybody uh, sh um, getting involved uh, with this poll. So a lot, a lot we anticipate then a lot of use of masks. Uh, we anticipate uh, a lot of uh, slit lamp screens. Uh, maybe the other. Uh, components of gloves and aprons less so. 
but I would agree. I would agree that this is going to bring about quite a bit of change for us. Now, what do we know about how contact lens wearers are reacting at this time? The answer is there is not much information in uh, generally available, uh, but a small survey that I did um, about a month ago, we approached 100 patients, contact lens wearers who came to our clinics. Uh, most of them reported that they were in lockdown. They were largely living uh, based at home. And of those patients living at home, about close to three quarters said they were wearing their contact lenses less. And I thought this was really fascinating. I wanted to know why they were wearing their lenses less. And the answer is, um, and this perhaps won't surprise you, there's less need. And I think there were three main reasons they were reporting. Firstly, um, uh, they, um, they associate contact lenswear with going to work and looking smart, and, and they're not doing that at the moment. They associate contact lens with socializing and being with their friends. Well, they're not doing that at the moment. And thirdly, and I guess most contact lens wearers are myopes, they're actually, they're all inside. They're not, they're not using their distance vision as much. So for those three reasons, there's just less need at the current time. Interestingly, there wasn't meant much reports of people not wearing the lens because they were fearful of infections during their contact lens wear. There wasn't much of that. And this gives me optimism that once things get back to normal, once we move out of lockdown, and maybe you're seeing this as uh, countries in, in Asia move out of lockdown at this time, maybe we will see a quick resumption of normal contact lens wear. Okay, the last section is what we can be doing to advise our patients at this time. Remember that I said earlier that it's particularly important that our wearers, our patients are using their contact lenses safely at the moment. We don't want them leaving the house to seek care. Actually, the availability of care is much reduced at this time. So what do we know about how we can help them do this? The main reason people need to seek a contact lens, clinical clown, anything like an urgent basis is because of these sorts of responses, keratitis or corneal inflammatory events. This range of responses, inflammatory events at the ocular surface, these are all characterized by white blood cells moving into the cornea. This is why you can see these little white patches. These are infiltrates. Um, and there is a broad spectrum of these, but some of these require our patients to seek urgent attention, either through uh, yourselves as their ECP, maybe through other uh, ophthalmic colleagues, maybe, maybe a hospital. What do we know about this range of responses? So here we, these are all corneal infiltrative events. I might use the term CIE as we move through. These are all different types of keratitis as well. All of these terms mean the same thing. Well, we know that there's a broad range of these going from the green types. These are largely asymptomatic, somewhat insignificant, all the way through to the red types, microbial keratitis, potentially site threatening. And any of these sorts of events shown in the red box may require um, quick attention required by uh, the patient. So the orange and the red forms of CIEs. What do we know about these? Well, what is critical for us is that most of these relate to the presence of bacteria in and around the contact lens. This is one of the orange forms here. This is a contact lens peripheral ulcer. Um, I just want to explain what, what's going on here. Well, we have bacteria trapped between the contact lens and the cornea, Staphylococcus aureus. As part of the metabolism of these bacteria, they release toxins. These toxins may be detected by some of the inflammatory cells in the cornea. Uh, these inflammatory cells will talk to the local blood vessels, the blood vessels in the limbus. They'll, they'll be talking through the release of cytokines and other chemical messengers. This will cause white blood cells, neutrophils perhaps, to move into the cornea to come and defend the eye from this, uh, uh, the presence of these toxins. There's also a breakdown of tissue of the epithelium during a CLPU process. We don't really understand why perhaps that is. But this is how a CLPU forms, fundamentally because there is bacteria present around the contact lens. Now, clinically, what do we see? Well, clinically, we're going to see the white blood cells. That's the infiltrate. So we will see that. 
Uh, but we will also see the, if we have fluorescein in the tear film, we will see that fill in this, uh, this lo loss of tissue, this ulcer. And so we'll see that on the slit lamp too. Uh, CLPUs are often symptomatic. So you might get a call from a patient who needs your, who needs your advice or help. But remember, it relates to the presence of bacteria. And bacteria are also important for this other form of CI, microbial keratitis. Here we have different types of bacteria, mainly our concern here is with Pseudomonas aeruginosa, aerosa, and we're grateful for the work of Susie Fleitzig at the University of California, Berkeley, for giving us a lot of the information um, uh, around this. Pseudomonas can actually invade the, uh, the cornea more fully, move through the epithelium into the stroma, cause devastating changes to the ocular surface and we can have a massive inflammatory response and um, a big ulcer as well, something like this. This is very unusual, but once again, it relates to the presence of bacteria uh, around the uh, contact lens. So if we're gonna advise our patients, we need to think about a few things. Firstly, what forms of contact lens wear are more associated with these sorts of issues? Because if we know that, we can perhaps advise our patients and reduce the chance of them happening. And also, what steps can they take to reduce these sorts of issues? Well, let's think about the forms of contact lens wear. Firstly, in terms of infections or microbial keratitis, we know that the main risk factor here is extended wear, people sleeping in their lenses. I think the best data we have here are from Fiona Stapleton at the University of New South Wales, who reported, uh, well, um, 15 years ago now that uh, uh, 12 years ago now, in fact, that the, the likelihood of getting MK is maybe maybe approaching tenfold if you sleep in your lenses versus not sleeping in lenses. So that's a, a risk factor we need to consider. What about more generally these this family of CIEs or keratitis cases? Well, I think the main information we have here is that these are much less likely in daily disposables. If you reuse contact lens where uh, if you re reuse contact lens with solutions, the likelihood of you getting a CIE is about 12, 12 times as great. So in terms of protective forms of contact lens wear, we need to think about daily wear instead of extended wear and daily disposables instead of reusing lenses. Now, I don't think we have to, we're not going to suddenly change everybody overnight into these forms of contact lens wear, but where that is possible, and I'll conclude with this in a few moments, uh, some examples, but where that is possible, we might want to advise our patients to move over to those lens types. And you know, there's something interesting about daily disposables and their benefits in terms of minimizing these sorts of responses. Um, this recent work by Robin Chalmers published um, in 2015, she looked at over a thousand contact lens wearers and kept uh, they were all using daily disposables and they kept very close to these wearers, kept uh, talking to these contact lens patients. These were being fitted in regular optometry practices, but they were being followed external to that by Robin Chalmers and her team. And in over 1,000 years of contact lens use, there were only two reports of symptomatic CIEs. And indeed, for one of the lens types, there were no reports of any CIE. So they, there's something about daily disposables that are is in, inherently good at minimizing the number of these CIEs. I think we're going to talk in the future a lot about the inflammatory response of the ocular surface to contact lenses and a little bit of work we've published recently um, actually supports the use of daily disposables. When we think about keratitis, we're talking that's a clinically significant, a clinically obvious event. But we can also look at subclinical response of the ocular surface. For example, here by looking with a confocal microscope at the cornea and at the conjunctiva. This allows magnification of 800 times and allows us to see some of the inflammatory cells of the eye. And we found that when we fit people with daily disposable lenses here, showing the number of uh, inflammatory cells that we visualized with the confocal microscope, we see that a, a follow-up visit in somebody wearing daily disposables, it's not very different than before they'd started to wear contact lenses. But when people are reusing lenses, the number of these cells 
seems to be rather high. So there's something about daily disposability of contact lenses that is protective against inflammatory responses, uh, both subclinical here, but also CIEs. So how can we best advise our patient for them to look after their lenses? Well, of course, we know there are many steps. Graham Young reported 49 steps that are required each day if somebody's using solution with their contact lens. That's too many. Which of these are the mo most important? I think these are the most important steps of contact lens wear. And the reason I say this is that on this list has all been associated with an increase of infection or inflammation in patients who are not doing these steps correctly, people who are not washing their hands, people who are not using the correct solution, people who are not replacing their lenses at the right time. These are all associated with an increase of infection or inflammation. Uh, and some of these changes are quite significant. Maybe uh, up to 50 times increase if they're not doing some of these steps correctly. That's the increase in risk of getting an infection during contact lens wear. So I think these eight steps are particularly important. They're all associated with the risk of getting an infection or an inflammatory event. But how good are people at doing these eight important steps? We did a survey on this a few years ago. Uh, across the world, we, had, we spoke to over 4,000 contact lens wearers. And this is how good patients are at these steps. Some things they're pretty good at. Look, correct solution. 80% of people use the correct solution with their contact lenses. But over on the right-hand side of these slides, we see things where people are very poor. And there are three of these I want to just briefly focus on today. Hand washing, rub and rinse, and case cleaning. These tick three important boxes. One, they're associated with an increase of risk of infection or inflammation if you don't do them. Two, we know from this chart that most people do not do these steps. And three, it has been shown that with further information and further advice, people can get better at doing this with their contact lenses. So hand washing, rub and rinse, and case cleaning. Now I think these are generally important, but they seem particularly important at this time with the coronavirus uh, that we have uh, going around the world at the moment, because hand washing we know is good for that uh, coronavirus. It's also important for contact lens wear. Rubbing and rinsing and case care, that's all about uh, cleaning. And again, the virus we know is susceptible to detergents and surfactants. So uh, how do we do these? Well, I think you know this. There are lots of, um, there are lots as advice around ha hand washing first. Um, you might hear happy birthday playing in the background. You should sing happy birthday twice whilst washing your hands. But remember to tell your patients that they need to specifically wash any of the parts of the hands that come into contact with the contact lens or the contact lens blister. So the fingertips, the thumbs, uh, especially. Rubbing and rinsing we know is important. It, this is probably going to help remove the virus from the lens if, if, if indeed that is a risk for a particular patient. And we don't talk enough finally about the case. It's important that when our patients, patients using solutions who have cases, when they put the lenses in the morning, the solution needs to be thrown away down the sink. A lot of patients just keep the solution and just top it up later in the day to save money. That's not good. The solution is being used. It is, it is spent at that time. So the solution needs to be thrown away. The inside of the case should be dried with a tissue with a little bit of force, perhaps just breaking down any biofilm that might be formed. And the case should be stored dry without, without the tops on, face down on a tissue through the day. So hand washing, rubbing and rinsing, case care, really important. There's perhaps one other video that you can find this on the internet if you search for hand washing with ink. It just shows for it to fully wash your hands how you need not just to sort of rub your, rub your hands together, rub the palms together, but actually interlock your fingers uh, and do a full hand wash. And again, for our patients who are contact lens wearers, it's the fingertips and th anything that might come into contact with the, the foil or the blister or the solution or the lens itself. Well, Karen, I've come to my final slide today. Let's just summarize what hopefully I've been trying to talk about. At the moment, I think we can be confident that contact lens wear remains to be as safe as before in the current pandemic. We don't see any evidence 
at this time of increased infection rates in contact lens wearers. We, we're not fully sure about the propensity for this virus to attach at the ocular surface. The balance of the literature at the moment suggests this is maybe not a, a, a key target for the virus. It's probably getting in more as we breathe it in, in through our, our mouths. But we, we need to be very, very vigilant and keep on top uh, of the literature. There are some important steps, though, that we can advise our patients on uh, at the present time. In particular, hand washing, rub and rinse, and case care. Always important messages, more so at the moment. This is going to reduce the likelihood of them having a problem for them to come and need your advice or the advice of any of our other healthcare professionals. I spoke a little bit about the, the protection of daily wear and of daily disposables. I think there are some groups who, who could easily move into this. Patients, for example, who sort of move between extended wear and daily wear in their lens, the same lens type, but sometimes they wear them, they sleep in them, and sometimes they don't. Maybe now is a good time just to move down to a daily wear modality. I don't think we can say this across the board immediately for any extended wearers, because a lot of people, if they're in extended wear, maybe they don't have a solution, maybe they don't have a case, maybe they're not sure how solutions should be used. I think if people though do move from one to the other, they, they possibly are some a group who could move into daily wear. Similarly for daily disposal, I don't think remotely where practices are not open, I don't think we can just tell everybody to move into daily disposals. We need to know that the lens is a good fit on the eye. We need to be seeing our patients in order to give that advice. But some patients, a small number, do keep stocks of both lens types. They have reusable lenses, maybe for normally through the week, and maybe daily disposables for holidays and at weekends and for special events. Maybe that group could easily now move to daily disposable because you know that that lens works. You've hopefully fitted the lenses. But I don't advocate a massive change to these different sorts of lenses uh, overnight. I think we need to take, take time and care and see that the lenses fit. This is a very quickly moving situation. I would encourage, encourage everybody to keep, uh, keep uh, an eye on the literature that's coming out and do keep reading the, the relevant web pages. Many of us are locked down. Maybe we have time to, to do this. And we need to start to think as a community, as an ECP community, about how, what are we gonna do in terms of face masks, slit lamp shields, and everything else. We saw from the poll, a lot of people are thinking about this now. Um, it's something we need to, I think, around the world, see what everybody's doing, look at the advice that's coming out, and hopefully, as an eye care community, we can reach some, uh, some decisions here, keep ourselves safe, keep our patients safe, but also keep them successful in their contact lenses. They still remain such a fantastic um, uh, modality for vision correction. So we should, we should have confidence about contact lenses at this time. Karen, that brings me, I think, to a close. I'm grateful for everybody uh, to watch today across Asia Pacific. What a, what a privilege it is for me to be able to deliver this presentation around the world. I'm very, very grateful for your time in watching it. And uh, Karen, I'll throw back to you in case we've had any questions come in. Yes, thank you. And Thank you, Phil, uh, for this uh, really informative session. Thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, my personal key takeaway is, um, you know, first of all, there's no evidence of increased infection in contact lenses related to COVID-19. Uh, and the new norm uh, will include optimizing compliance, uh, particularly, you know, hand washing, like you said, rub and rinse, and also case cleaning. We do have... Um, a lot of questions actually. We have 13 questions from the floor. Uh, we try to uh, answer uh, as uh, many as we can. So let's start with um, the most popular question. That is the, the question that has the most votes. Any, any connection between water content and tonicity of material with viral problem? Uh I'm not aware of any work or any evidence around that, Karen. I think, as I mentioned before, um, it's, it's difficult to work with this virus. I know that we have um, labs at our university working with this virus, trying, to, but they're working towards vaccines and these sorts of really big questions. So I think as far as I'm aware, and there could be some work that I'm not aware of, but 
Uh, as far as I'm, a, uh, as I'm aware around the world, we don't have too much, we don't have any evidence at the moment about um, a different contact lens materials. We know that the virus is not, it does not survive well in water. It doesn't appear to be um, in, in sort of water supplies and other things. So I would not expect, it's not obvious to me that there should be differences between different um, water contents, different tonicities and other material types. It's, I think it's too early to conclude that. All right. Okay. That's, that's good. And we do have more and more people voting. So, uh, okay. So the next uh, question that got the most votes, uh, uh, should medical, should medical professional wear contact lenses? A question from my friendly medical doctor at isolation ward wearing spectacle with face shield is really troubled, but he mm. worries about virus stay longer or trapping contact lenses. May I, may I have your expert opinion? Yeah, this, this is a good question. And you know, so much of contact lens wear is a sort of, you know, it's a risk versus benefit consideration, isn't it? And I, I have heard about um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of people who are in, in the protection wearing safety goggles or wearing the face masks and they're finding that their, their spectacles are, do not work uh, very well. I guess people will have different views. My view is that that person probably can work better in, in the contact lenses versus their, their spectacles. I think as long as they are very, you know, hygienic with how they apply their contact lenses, and I'm sure, I'm sure uh, this questioner's colleague working in, uh, in this medical department will, will be that. They've got great access to uh, soaps and hand washes and all the rest. I think probably in that case, contact lenses are a, are a good option because it's gonna you know, help their work. It's probably gonna make them deliver better care to their patients and indeed be much more comfortable in doing so. You know, I think it's a risk and it's, it's, it's a benefit, but I, I have heard reports that it's, uh, people are moving to contact lenses in those environments. Indeed, this is something we're trying to look at. We've got a proposal as part of my group at the moment that we, we hope to look at the benefits of, uh, of contact lenses in people who have to wear the PPE, the very sorts of protective uh, equipment. Okay. All right. That's very clear. And um, okay. Another question with 61 votes. After how many days uh, can we fit contact lenses to COVID patient who had a successful treatment? Well, again, unfortunately, I'm going to have to answer, uh, you know, we don't know. I'm not sure. There's so much of this is, is brand new. We'd certainly, we would certainly want the patient uh, to be clear of COVID disease. I think that probably, to be absolutely sure, now needs uh, will mean a number of weeks after they have um, uh, 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 finished with the infective part of the process. I do hear reports about people being extremely, extremely tired and fatigued for many weeks after they've had COVID infection. I think we'd want to make sure we were totally clear of all of that stage. Uh, uh, and uh, before we would consider uh, fitting with, with contact lenses. You know, I mean, remember our advice around not using contact lenses applies to people with uh, active COVID-19 disease. Any, any respiratory tract infection we have concerns about with contact lens wear. But we've always said that. We've said that not just for this current pandemic, but with really anybody who's unwell should not be wearing their contact lens just to give us an extra, uh, an extra safety net uh, with their with their eyes, so I think the same applies to COVID nineteen. We should be cautious and conservative of fitting people who we know have had COVID nineteen infection. Okay, that's uh, very clear. Um, okay, we have another question, uh, similar but not exactly the same. So, if a patient is diagnosed with COVID nineteen and undergone treatment, can we refit contact lenses to him? Yeah, I think I, th I think the same applies there, Karen. We need to just be careful yeah. and cautious, and have a number of weeks where we're sure they've been clear of the disease, but also that they have sort of that they, they appear to be healthy and they're not going through this sort of fatigued state. They should be sort of through that before we wish to consider lenses. I think. Yeah, I agree. One last question. So one yeah. last question. 
Okay, you had mentioned that in UK, you are finding or expecting more patients going to optometry practice compared to hospital. Any specific reason? Yeah, and this might be a particular UK thing. We know that um, the hospitals have been also operating very differently for the last three months now. They have not been seeing routine patients for glaucoma, for cataract, for macular degeneration, all routine appointments have been suspended. So we now have a huge number of people who need to be seen, and yet the hospitals are still really not operating normally. So the our health service, the National Health Service, has seen that the best way perhaps to get through this backlog of, of patients is to use optometrists a lot more. So we have new schemes which have been set up where it's optometrists are going to be in the first instance uh, uh, with routine patients or indeed patients who are having uh, acute problems, optometrists are going to be phoning them um, uh, to triage them, work out if they need to be examined or not and uh, potentially offering prescriptions actually remotely. Uh, but if the patient needs to be seen then make arrangements for, to, be, to come in for an examination. So um, basically, the reason for this is that we have this big backlog across ophthalmology and the, the solution that the government has seen, which I would absolutely support, is optometry is the answer here to use the skills and the experience and the availability of optometry and optometrists to help um, to help solve this, this uh, national backlog. And uh, yeah, it's interesting that this problem, this pandemic has brought about this opportunity for optometry, which otherwise it might have taken a few years for us to, to get to. Okay, that's, uh, yes, that's very true. Uh, all right, so in view of time, uh, we, uh, you know, this uh, webinar session is actually coming to an end. But before we end our session, uh, I would like to remind you all um, that there will be a link sent to you right after the end of the session for you to provide feedback to us related to today's webinar. And at the end of the feedback form, you will see a link to the MCQ test in order to get the CPE point from your professional association. Uh, a certification of completion will also be sent out to the participants within uh, two weeks' time. Uh, we have come to the end of uh, today's webinar session. Thank you, Bill, uh, for your sharing. And most importantly, thank you, everyone, for participating. Hope you enjoy the session today and um, see you again in the next JJI webinar on May 19th by John Waring, who is a professional coach. Uh, and this professional coach uh, will be sharing with us how we can go through uh, the pandemic um, together uh, with uh, the rest of our family and friends and our colleagues. So take care everybody and stay safe.